Okay, good morning. Time to start with our lecture for today. Uh, I'm going to ask you to turn off your, your screen, your computers. Um, also to pay attention to what we're going to be discussing today. As uh, you already know, we are having our second exam on Tuesday. So my plan for today's lecture is to cover, basically go over the dual theory material again, which is going to be part of your exam, and also complete the, the material. I think we have only one more topic to cover at the end of this lecture. And after that, we're going to look at the review, which is already posted on track. And we're going to discuss some, some problems from the homework that I posted on Tuesday. And then I'm going to basically answer questions, some of the questions that you might have for, for the exam. Okay? Is there any questions at, the, at this point? I, I also noticed that some of you are not, I mean, I looked through the homework. I don't have the, the grades for the homework yet, but I'm going to have them ready tomorrow. If you want to pick your homework, you use it to study for the for the exam during the weekend. You can stop by tomorrow and your homework will be graded. But I noticed that some of you didn't complete some of the problem. And I was wondering what happened. Did you have time or you didn't understand what you were trying to do or the problems were too long? Can I get some feedback from from you? Yeah. All of the above. Yeah. Well, I thought that since you had spring break, I thought <laughs> the, you were going to be working on studying for the homework. And I, that was not the case, actually. I mean, some of you were, I mean, were able to work on all the problems, but I would say half of you just tried, but I don't think that you put a lot of time on the, on the homework. Um, you know, you had that spring break break to try to, to work on it. Do you have a lot of exams this week or? Okay, so that's something else. I assume, I heard that some of you are having a couple of exams this week. Um, but what I'm worried about is I don't want that to affect your, your performance on the, on the exam. So I posted the solution. You can take a look to the solution. The material is not hard. If you have questions, just let me know. It's just, I mean, once you understand what you're, what you're supposed to do, you should be able to complete the, the problems. Something that I know is the homework asks you to basically solve, formulate and solve the, the problem. I will not ask you to do that in the exam. So basically, you can assume that you have the optimal tableau for some of the sensitivity analysis problem. You can assume that you have the optimal tableau, the solution, and start from there. So find the ranges, find, um, be aware of what does ranges mean. So if you go above them, you know that your solution will change. If you are within the ranges, then you know that the solution, the optimal solution will be still optimal. That type of thing. And also, I'll go over those details in the review. Uh, if you remember, we also discussed how to get the sensitivity analysis report from the Excel. So if you can look at the report, and basically based on the report, I can ask you some questions based on, on that report. So you should understand what that report means and so on. Okay? So just to give you an idea of what type of question you should expect in the, in the exam. So is it still going to be on the exam at all? No, I, I will provide you with the, with the answer, okay. the tables. You don't have to use Excel <laughs> in the exam. Okay? But just understanding what that report means, that's, that will be uh, part of the exam. Okay, so this is what we covered last Tuesday. We started talking about the dual theory and how the dual of a linear programming problem can be useful when you have certain type of problems. So if you have a problem that has um, multiple constraints, and you want to change that problem using the dual to have less constraints but more variables, that can help you to improve the solution time. 
how, how long it's going to take to get the solution. So far, you, your problems, especially the ones that you solve using the computer, were very fast. You get the solution very fast because those were very small problems. But um, I'm thinking of giving you an example maybe later in the class in the semester, in which you will see that if you have a larger problem, the computer will take a lot of time to get that optimal solution. You're talking about there are some problems that can take you like three, four days of computer power running in order to get the optimal solution. So most of the time if you're dealing, let's say, with airplane traffic, that type of problem in which you want to find the optimal schedule for your airplane, in this particular airplane, airport, I'm sorry, that will take a lot of time. Like if you're dealing with, I don't know, a thousand airplanes in an hour, if you want to get the best schedule to land those airplanes in your airport, in order to get that solution, that, that will consume a lot of computer power, and the slower the computer, the longer it will take. And uh, So that's why it's very important to have these methods and understand the structure of the problem in order to get, be able to get the optimal solution as soon as possible. So based on that, the dual problem will give you a different structure for the same problem, but you know when you solve the problem, you will get the same optimal solution for the dual and the primary. So we define the dual problem, and we, we discuss that they are closely related, and the optimal solution will be the same for both problems. And in our definition of the dual problem, we need to express the primal in equation form, which means that you need to change those inequalities to equalities in your constraints. And the key ideas for constructing dual, we went through these five ideas. We need to assign a dual variable. We need to construct a dual constraint for each primal variable. And the column constraint coefficient and the objective coefficient of the J primal, primal variable respectively define the left hand and the right-hand side of the, of the constraint for the dual problem. The dual objective coefficients equal the right-hand side of the primal constraint equations, and the sense of optimization, direction of inequalities, and the uh, signs of the variables in dual are governed by the table, by these rules. Okay? So we use those um, ideas in this table we work on these examples, so we were able to formulate the dual based on the primal for a maximization problem. So this is the dual, you know it's going to be a minimization problem, and you will construct these constraints using the coefficients for each variable in the primal. Then we look at how to find the dual for a, a minimization problem. So in that case, we'll go to a maximization problem. And you follow the same uh, rules and ideas. And then we discuss one last example in which you had a unrestricted variable. And we discuss how to handle that unrestricted variable using this substitution. But at the end, you should be able to get a dual. And the main, most important part here was that you have these two constraints, and at the end, that will become only one constraint because when you combine them, you can make them inequality. Okay, so the summary, and I pointed out that you can have this table in your uh, formula sheet that will help you to find the dual from a primal, and you should expect a problem of that type in your exam. So I'll give you a formulation, a primal, an LP model, and I will ask you to find the dual, for sure. Okay, so make sure that you understand how to get the dual from the primal. So if the primal is maximization, then the dual is minimization, and vice versa. Then we talk a little bit about the relationship between the dual and the primal. So changes made in the data of an LP model can affect the optimality and the feasibility of the current optimal solution. So this part of the lecture discusses the primal dual relationship used to recompute the elements of the optimal simplex tableau. 
and this relationship formed the basis of the economic interpretation of the LP model and for cost optimality analysis. So the discussion were based on I mean, we, we discussed the, the importance of the starting tableau and the optimal tableau in the simplex method and how the identity matrix basically identify your basic initial variables. And then at the optimal, you know that the place in which this identity matrix was, at the optimal solution will provide you with an inverse matrix. And that inverse matrix is what you can use to find the optimal values for the dual problem. And we discussed two methods. So after this, to find the optimal dual solution, and these are the two methods. And we're going to refer back to this later in the class. So if you have the optimal tableau for the primal, you can find the optimal dual variables by using that tableau. So think about having their original problem, and you want to find what are the values of the optimal variables for the dual problem. So this is what the problem, these two methods are doing. You get the you have two different well, you have two different problems or two different formulations for the same problem, the primal and the dual. If you solve the primal, you'll get some optimal solutions for the primal. These two methods will tell you, okay, you get the solution, you have the solution for the primal. I can tell you what are the solutions for the same problem, what are the decision variables or the optimal decision variables for the dual. Okay? So we go from using the primal information, you will get the optimal values for the dual value. And this is what these two methods are doing. So the, the elements of the row vector must appear in the same order of the basic variable listed in the basic column of the simplex tableau. So if your optimal solutions were X3 in the column, if you have X3 Let's say this is your tableau, this is C, and this is the solution, and this are the x2, x1, this is 3, and 2. Let's say this is 15, the optimal solution. Then when you list this, what this is saying is the elements of the row vector must appear in the same order of the basic variable. So the order here is x2 x1. Okay? Because it's based on your basic variables uh, column. If this were x2, x1, and x2, then this will be x1 and x2. So that order is important for method 2. Okay? That order is important. So, let's we went through this example, we found the dual. Then, based on the primal optimal tableau, we found the optimal dual values, values which are y1 and y2. That is what we did using the first method. Okay, so we used the information from the primal optimal tableau to find the Values, the optimal values for the primal of the dual variables. So, optimal dual y1 and y2. y1 is 29 over 5 and y2 is minus 2 over 5. And I mentioned that one way to verify that this optimal solution for dual is correct, does anyone remember what you, you can do to verify that this solution is correct? You found the optimal solution for the prime, right? And you know x2 
So you found x primal, you found x cubed equals 12 over 5, x1 equals 26 over 5, right? And this is coming from here. So these are the optimal values from the tableau. x2 equals this, x1 equals this, okay? So from there, in order to get this number, the optimal solution, if you go here, you use the, the primal objective function. So in that case is 5x1 plus 12x2 plus 4x3. That's the objective function. So if you substitute this number, this is 5 times 26 over 5 plus 12 times 12 over 5 plus 4 times 0 because x3 equals 0. This should be equal to this. 54 4 over 5. Because that's the optimal solution for the prime. Now, if you want to verify that these numbers are right, then you can come here. Back here you have the objective function for the dual. So that is 10y1 plus 8y2 dual. So if you take these values, y1 equals 29 over 5, and y2 equals minus 2 over 5, then this 10 times 29 over 5 plus 8 times minus 2 over 5 should be equal to 54 4 over 5. If these numbers does not give you this same objective function, that means that there's something wrong here. Because it should be the same solution. Because the primal and the dual will give you exactly the same optimal solution. Is that clear? Okay, so if I ask you to find the dual, and then I ask you to find the optimal values based on the optimal tableau from the primal, you can use one of the two methods. So if you use method number one, you will get this and this. If you want to just make sure that your exercise is right and you got the right answer, you can always do this. Because you will have this already. So if you just check your values with the objective function of the dual, you will make sure that if that number is the same, you'll get the, the right answer. Okay? There's no way that the your answer is going to be wrong. Any questions? Okay, so I'm just giving you that help, extra help, if you want to make sure that your um, exam is, is correct, at least an exercise similar to this one. Then we discuss method number two. So this is method one. Method number two will give you the same answer. And what I was discussing in terms of the order, you go back here. Here is where the order in the simplex basic variable is important. So if it is listed at x2 and x1, then you should put those values as we did here, 12 and 5. Okay. Um, it will depend on the on these values. Yeah, because you are multiplying that. I if it were the identity matrix, yes, not that it will depend on those. Any any questions? And you know this is coming from from the from here. So this is the final identity matrix. Okay? 
and we will discuss two extra problems um, in the review, basically looking at this one more time, and that basically tells you that this is important, and that you should expect something like this in the, in the exam. Okay, so I'm basically giving you two, two problems already of what you should expect, the dual and finding the optimal from the dual. Okay, so primal dual objective functions, so we discussed this. We also went through the economic interpretation of the of duality. So I'm going to skip this, because if not, I'm, I'm going to have enough time to cover the review. Um, I think I posted these notes, so you should have access up to here. And also, I posted the video, so where you... Someone try to open the video. Open. Okay. So the video is also available. Um, so let's start here. This is the post-optimal analysis. So in, in lecture eight, we dealt with the sensitivity of the optimum solution. We determined the ranges for the different LP parameters that will keep the optimal basic variables unchanged. And this is lecture A was the sensitivity analysis lecture. In this lecture, or this part of the lecture, we deal with making changes in the parameters of the model and finding the new optimal solution. And I'm going to refer back, just to make sure they make those notes, and I'm going to refer back to, to the example, the Hoiko example. In which we were trying to determine how many trucks, trains, and cars we should produce for this toy company. And we have the constraints for the operations and the number of hours per operation that we have available, and we were trying to maximize our revenue based on these revenues per product. So, we have the problem, and if you solve this problem, the optimal solution, as we saw already in class, is $1,350 when you produce no trucks or no trains, 100 trucks, and I believe it was cars, 230 cars. That's your optimal solution. That was the answer for that question, for those questions. Okay, so now I want to find the dual for this problem. So let me write the dual. So again, we follow the same concepts. We have a maximization problem, so now we have a minimization for the dual. So minimize z equals 430 y1 plus 460 y2 plus 420 y3. So you know that you need to define a dual variable for each constraint. Okay, so I have a dual variable for first constraint, for the second one, and for the third one. And from there, you just multiply the right-hand side times that dual variable, and you get the objective function. Okay, and you are, that should be the W, sorry. So you're taking the right-hand side and you're constructing the objective function for the dual using the right-hand side. Now, this write the constraint, so it's subject to y1 plus 3y2 plus y3 greater or equal to 3. Then we have 2y1 plus 4y3 greater or equal to 2 
then y1 plus 2y2 greater or equal to 5. y1, y2, and y3 greater or equal to 0. And the optimum, optimal solution is y1 equals 1, y2 equals 2, y3 equals 0, and w equals Yes. Uh, why am I Oh, yeah. Um, I skipped one step here. And I apologize for that. I needed to make this equalities first. See, so remember the first step was to make this an equality and then move to the next step. So let me see if I can construct this really quick. So x1 at the end is going to be the same answer. 2x2 plus x3 plus x4. I guess you don't need that one. Equals 430. Then you have 3x1. Plus zero plus two x three And then you need to add some extra constraints here. So at the end you will see that how that will become a y3 equals or greater 2 because this x3 now will become an extra constraint. So it will be y3 or y2 greater or equal to 0 should be it will be y y4 y2 greater or equal to 0 and y3 greater or equal to 0 okay so that was that is why that becomes this uh, again, I don't want to confuse you. So the first step you always need to do is to make this an equality. Remember? Because those constraints are less than or equal. Okay, so that's what I'm doing here. I'm adding those slacks and making those constraints equality. Okay, once you have that in equality form, then you move and construct the tool. So from here, you go to here. So you start with y1 plus y3, y2 plus y3, greater or equal to 3. Then for the second constraint, you have 2y1 plus 4y3, greater or equal to 2. For the third, third constraint, you have y1 plus 2y3, sorry, 2y2 plus 0 greater or equal to 5. Then you come to the slack variables. You have y1. You have no coefficient for x4 in your objective function, so that makes y1 greater or equal to 0. x5, you have no x5 coefficient here, so that makes x5 greater, y2 greater or equal to 0. And x6, you have no coefficients here for x6. So that makes y3 greater or equal to 0. So at the end, you know this y1, y2, y3 should be unrestricted. 
But since you have those black variables, that will make them greater or equal to zero. Okay? So I apologize for skipping this part, but this is important. Okay, and we have the optimal solution. So if you solve the dual, you know that you need to get the same optimal solution as the primal. So this is the solution for the primal. It's the same solution. You can solve it using the uh, simplex method, but in this part of the lecture, we're not focusing on solving the problem. We are basically focusing on analyzing the solution. So if you solve it, this is what you're going to get, these values. Does anyone remember? We got these numbers at some point in the primal where we were looking at the sensitivity analysis. This number show, wanted to show it up somehow. Do you remember what those numbers mean? Those were the goal prices. So, you're basically we're saying that if you added an extra unit of, I believe it was X2, you were adding a unit of profit. So, if you won't go back to the past lecture, you will see that these numbers show up. So, that those were dual prices. Okay? So, the dual value variables are telling you what are the dual prices for your for your problem. Okay, so let's look now at uh, changes affecting feasibility. So the feasibility of the current optimal solution is affected only if the right hand side of the constraints is changed. By changing the right hand side, what you're doing is modifying the available resources that you have. Okay? So right hand side is basically the right hand side of the constraint is telling you instead of having 60 hours, now you have 100. Okay, so that the feasibility of the optimal solution is affected only if you change it, if you change that availability of your resource. If you go from 100 hours of one resource and you go to zero, you know that the solution would, would be affected. And that could not be a feasible uh, your current solution or your current optimal solution might not be feasible anymore. This change requires recomputing the right hand side of the tableau using the following formula. So, in order to get the new right hand side of the tableau in iteration i, you need to multiply the inverse in iteration i times the new right hand side of the constraint. This is the type of formula that you need to put in your formula sheet. Okay? So, to recompute the right hand side of the tableau, you need this formula. Recall that the right hand side of the tableau gives the values of the basic value. Okay, so now let's look at two examples of changes that could affect the feasibility. So suppose that the company is increasing the daily capacity of operations, one, two, and three, to 600, 600 640, and 590 minutes. So you want to know how will that affect your revenue. So let me go back to the problem here. Maybe it would be good to have this formulation. Here. Maybe I can copy and fix that.
Okay, so this is our problem. And what we're saying is, we want to increase daily capacity of operations of operation 1, 2, and 3 to 600, so from 430 to 600, 640, and 590 minutes. So each operation will be increased. So this will become... So, how will this uh, change the affect the total revenue? So, with these increases, the only change that will take place in the optimum tableau is the right hand side. the constraints. So, we know that the only change that will take place in the optimal tableau is the right hand side of the constraints. And we can use this to get the new right hand side of the tableau for the optimal iteration. So that's what we're going to do here. So we have x2, x3, and x6 be equal to the inverse at that point of the tableau. And um, I'm going to allow you to use the calculator in the in the exam, just in case that you need to compute something like this. You don't have to do it by hand. So if you want to bring your calculator, you can bring it to the exam. 140, 320, and 30. So, since these are positive, the current basic variables x2, x3, and x6 remain Feasible. Okay, so feasible basically means that you are satisfying the constraints. Since you know that x1, x2, and x3, all your variables need to be positive or greater or equal to zero, as long as they are positive, they remain feasible. Okay, so they stay feasible. And the associated Optimum revenue is three times zero plus two times hundred and forty plus five times three hundred and twenty, and that is equal to this. So increasing the and this is using the objective function here. So increasing your operations 
will increase your revenue. Remember, the revenue was $1,350. Of course, if you have more time for produce more units, your revenue should increase. And that's why you're seeing here. So by increasing the operation time, you're increasing your revenue because you're increasing your production. Okay? Um, let's look at situation number two. And I think I'm going to have to wait. Let's see how far we can go before. So I need some time to discuss the review. So, so let's look at this second situation. Although the new solution is appealing from the standpoint of increasing revenue, the company recognized that its implementation may take time. So another proposal shifts the slack capacity of operation three, in which you have X6 equals 20 minutes, to the capacity of operation one. How will this change in the impact in the optimal solution? So what we are saying here is, let me go back here. So you know X, X6 is not part of your production schedule because your production schedule is only defined by X1, X2, and X3, which are your products. You're having a slack variable with the value, positive value here. That slack is consuming part of your resources. What you're trying to do is, since this is not adding a unit of production to your schedule, you want to move that time that you have available, that extra time that you have available, to one of the other um, operations. So I'm going to move those 20 units in the capacity of operation 3 to operation number 1, which basically is changing your right hand side so the capacity mix of the three Operations changes to 450, 460, and 400. So you're moving 20 units from operation 3, so it used to be 420, you're taking 20 units, and you're putting those 20 units here in the first operation. So that's why this becomes 400, and this becomes 450. So the resulting solution is and this is the same procedure, X2, X3, and X6. Take the inverse from the optimal tableau. Times the, right, the new right-hand side, 450, 460, and 400 and this will become this 230 on minus 40. Is that solution feasible? It's not feasible because x6 is less than 0. Okay, so there's a variable that is not positive so the resulting solution is 
solution is invisible because x6 is less than 0. Okay, so from here you can you can find the optimal solution for having this right hand side. What this is telling you is that the current solution is not feasible. But that doesn't mean that you can find an optimal solution for that problem. The issue is in order to find this, you need to perform a set of computations, basically an adaptation of the simplex algorithm. For the purpose of this class, we are not going to be dealing with that part of the simplex method, but we're going to have a new course coming up next semester in which those topics are going to be covered. What it's called is, you can come up from here, at this point of the tableau, you can find an optimal solution using what is called the simplex dual algorithm. But again, that's not part of this class. It's very um, time, requires a lot of time. So that's why we have that part of the the course in it, this new course that is going to be taught by teach by Dr. Novo next semester. So if you are interested in this type of talk, you, you can always take that class. So I guess there's more people that <laughs> are considering that part of. Well, if you enjoy math and Again, this type of material is difficult, it's hard, but if you are one of the few who master these type of topics, then you're going to separate yourself from most of the industrial engineers because, because it's hard, not a lot of people want to go in depth, but if you are able to master these topics, then you'll be, you will be able to get a lot of opportunities in the job. Okay, so that's, that will open your doors to rail companies, airplane companies, production companies, manufacturing companies, bank, you name it, because this stuff is very useful. So that being said, if you're interested, you can always talk to me and I'll tell you more about that class, but it's going to be offered next semester. Okay, so I don't think we're going to have time to cover this part of the lecture because I want to move to the to the review. So, um, if you want to study for the exam, then study up to here, up to slide 34. We can go over this after the exam. So let me pull up the the review. Okay, so this review is essentially very similar to the review we saw for the first exam. So I'm basically listing the topics that you should focus in the preparation for the exam. So you should expect 10 multiple true or false questions as you, you saw in the first exam. I really encourage you to look at the slides with the, the bullets. Um, understand what they need because most of the time my true or false questions are coming from, from the bullets in the in the lectures. So this this is just a way for you to study not only the problem but also understanding what's what's going on in the in the lectures. Section number two is four topical problems, most likely um, math problems, so I already give you a hint of what you should expect for two problems of the exam. Um, also, I mentioned it that I can have you um, ask questions about the report from Excel just to see if you can understand what the report is telling you and how will that affect. You remember when we did the uh, sensitivity analysis, I uh, I presented you with some questions. I don't know if you remember in that lecture, there were a part in which I gave you some results and I was asking you what 
which operation would you consider to increase the number of hours depending on the uh, revenue that you would get by increasing that uh, particular operation? Looking at your faces and you, <laughs> you see like you haven't seen that. So let me show you what I'm talking about here. Um, So this is a sensitivity analysis lecture. So we cover the graphical method and the algebraic method. Okay, here. See these questions? We went through these questions. And this is the type of question that I can ask you based on the, the results. So, if Jobco can increase the capacity of both machines, which machine should receive priority? And based on the result, you should be able to turn out this one because that will increase, that will have an increase in your, your revenue or will give you an extra, I don't know, how many dollars you need when compared to the first or the second machine. Or none of them should be, um, let's say if you consider an additional cost, and you find that that additional cost will not cover the extra unit, then you can tell me, oh, since there is an extra cost, then you shouldn't add any extra hours. So, to discuss these questions, um, so you can take a look, and basically, this is what tells me that you're understanding how to use those numbers. Okay, so going back here, so first, vector 7, we, we covered the artificial static solution, the M method and the two-phase method, and first one we're basically have several problems related to this. We, we discussed that one more in class, so please make sure that you understand those two methods. I will not ask you to solve the problem as we did in, in one of the labs in which you basically needed to write down every tableau. But I can fill, give you some spaces for you to fill out for one of the two methods. Okay, so that's why it's important for you to understand those methods. Um, you can always take a look at the homeworks and take a look to the lab. We did several labs in class that will also help you prepare for the exam. In terms of lecture 8, sensitivity analysis, graphical sensitivity analysis on the right hand side and the objective function and the algebraic sensitivity analysis for the right hand side and the objective function. And then here again, interpret the report for the sensitivity analysis of using the solver. And lastly, this is the last topic we cover, extra nine, dual theory, definition of the dual problem, final dual relationships, economic interpretation, and part of the post-optimal analysis, which is what we discussed today. Any any questions about yes? Uh, formulate? No, we don't have to formulate it. But I can give you a bottle. Formulating the problem, I don't know. Something you don't have time. So, um, but remember, formulation is an important part, but that's not part of this, this material. Okay, I'm assuming that you are mastering formulation at this point. <laughs> okay, um, but um, I'm going to provide you with the information. I'm going to test you on this topic. So, I want to know if you want to, if you know how to perform a M method analysis or two-phase method solution, if you understand what sensitivity analysis is and uh, how to find some of the numbers, the ranges for a particular uh, problem, and dual theory, how to formulate the dual, and, and so on. Okay? So now formulation. Um, in preparation for the exam, you can read chapter 3 and 4. In lecture 7, 8, and 9, I listed those uh, sections that you can read. 
So if you, if you want to read, it's not necessary. I, I think if you go over the lecture slide, the homework in the lab, you should be ready for the exam. But if you want to read the book, that's, that's always good. Um, you can read. So again, lecture slide, homework, and labs. Le uh, homework number, the one that was due on Tuesday, is going to be available tomorrow. So if you want to pick that homework, just stop by my office. I'm going to have that homework ready. If not, you always have the solution. So you can look at the solution on tracks in order for you to study. Um, form sheet is handwritten. Okay. You have to turn in that at the end of the exam. And I changed this rule a few minutes ago, so you can bring your, your calculator. Yes? We can't do that. No. No. I wanted you to write it down because that is proof to help you study. Okay? So if you write it down, you are studying while you're writing down. Okay? If you're copy and paste, that's not not helping you. So that's why I want you to write it in hand. By hand. Okay? So the exam is closed book and notes. You are allowed to use your formula sheet. Clearly show your work and all your formulas using your solutions. This will help me award full and partial credit. Any questions? So same format, no fractions, and four problems. 10 multiple choice to oppose questions. Um, and let's try to work on these problems just as a review. So this is again part of your the homework that I posted to on Tuesday. This is problem four. And it is basically related to the dual theory problem. Um, this is type of problem that you should expect in the, in the exam. So consider the following LP. You have a maximization problem, two constraints, and I'm giving you, um, I'm telling you that given that the artificial variable and the slab variable, x4 and x5, for the stating starting basic variables, and that n was set equal to 100, when solving the problem, the optimal top law is given. So this is the optimal solution for the primal. And I'm asking you to write the associated dual problem and determine its optimal solution. So what would you do? First, formulate dual, all right? You can do that straight from, from the primal. So let's work on that. The formulated dual. So we know that x4 is an artificial variable, so that means that you need to make this an equality using x4. So you have max z equals 5x1 plus 2x2 plus 3x3 subject to x1 plus 5 x2 plus 2x3 plus x4 and this is minus m x4 and this is going to be equal to 30. So that is an artificial variable and when you add that you're basically preparing your problem for the initial solution and the problem is telling you that x4 is going to be artificial variable and m was set to equal to 100 so you know that m here is equal to 100 now for the second constraint you have an inequality so you need to add a slack variable And the problem is telling you that the slack variable is x5. So that's why I'm using x5 up as my slack variable. 
sorry, e greater or equal to zero. Okay, so now I need to write the, the dual problem. So again, in order to get the dual, you need to define the primal in equality form. So the dual is minimize W equals 30, Y1. So I'm using Y1 here, Y2, Y1 for the first constraint, Y2 for the second constraint. So 30, Y1 plus 40, Y2, subject to Y1 plus Y2 greater or equal to 5. Then we have 5y1 minus 5y2 greater or equal to 2. Then we have 2y1 minus 6y2 greater or equal to 3. And then we have y4, y1, greater or equal to minus m, and then y2, greater or equal to 0. And, yes sir. M is going to be minus 100, so you can treat that as an unrestricted variable. Yes, you need to use the ball. Remember when you have an inequality, you need to, to find your starting solution in order to, to get to the simplex method, right? So that's what we're trying to do. We're going to make that a, put it in a equality form, but also a format that you can implement the simplex method, okay? So you, you need to find the equality form, but also that provides you with a starting uh, basic variable solution. That makes sense, okay? Because let's say instead of having x1 here, let's say that this was x1 plus 5x2 plus 2x3, and this x1 was not there, was empty, then you know that you already have a column with 1 and 0. So that means that you don't need to add an artificial variable because you can form your basic, basic variables using x1, if x1 was not there. If that was the case, then you already have a variable that will give you a 1, 0, and that will give you a basic variable for your initial solution. But that's not the case here. This is x1. So when you put it in, in a equality form, then you need to take that into account. And also the problem is guiding you. Okay? So read the problem. The problem is basically guiding you of what you need to do. This is telling you that you need to add x4 and x5. x4 is an artificial variable. So that's why I'm putting that x4 here. And x5 is also part of your solution. Okay? So now you have the dual, you have the tableau that is optimal, so you are you're basically done with the first part of the of the problem, by the associated dual problem. Now you need to determine its optimal solution in two ways. So you remember, and I mentioned it in early in this lecture, the two methods to get the optimal 
for the whole problem. And those are the two methods that we're going to use. So let me show you that again. So if you go back to, and you can write this down, you can refer to slide 80. You want to get the optimal solution of the dual. These are the two methods. That was one or two. Okay, so for that problem, you need to refer back to these two methods. Okay, so for method one, let me see if I can write those formulas here. Optimal Z coefficient of starting variable xi plus the original objective coefficient of That is method one. And method two is row vector of regional objective coefficients. of optimal primal basic variables times optimal primal inverse. So these are the two formulas for getting the optimal solution of the goal based on the primal. And those are listed again in the lecture in slide 18. So using method one, we have the optimal coefficient of starting variable xi. So What are our starting variables? Do you remember? Which ones are going to be our starting variables? Starting variables are the ones that give you your initial solution or your initial values for the tableau, for the first tableau. Correct. X4 and X5. So the optimal coefficient of the starting variables so you know that is x4 and x5. Now, the optimal coefficient for those two are 105 and 0. So these were the variables that you use. In, if you were to solve this problem using the simplex method, you know that your initial or your starting variables for that first tableau are going to be x4 and x5 because are the ones that will give you the columns with 1, 0 and 0, 1. Okay, so automatically make them the starting values. So now you want to know the optimal coefficient. 
the optimal coefficients are these two for x4 and x5. So, method one, coefficient of x4 equals 105. And you're going to add the original objective coefficient of xi. So for x4, what will be the original objective coefficient for x4? Yes. Anybody see why? Because you need to look at their coefficients, the original coefficients here in the objective function. For x4, the original objective coefficient, see so the objective function, is minus n. And you know n equals 100. So is that plus minus 100. And that is equal to 5. And this is equal to y1. Then for coefficient, of x5, you have 0 because the optimal z coefficient of the starting variable is 0, plus you have a coefficient here so this is 0 plus 0 so equals 0 and this is y2. So you have your optimal solution for the dual is 5 and 0. If you take y1 and you substitute y1 here instead of times 5, that's 150. 150. So you just verify your solution. Okay? Okay, so let me finish this problem. So the next part is using method number two. So using method two, You get y1, y2 will be equal to 5 and 0 times the identity matrix. And this is 5, 0, which is the same solution. So again, remember that the order that you're using here is important. So This order is important, and again, you should, all, should be able to get the same solution. Where is that first this is the row vector of original objective coefficients of the optimal primal variables. So, if you go here, one and five, this is five, and x five is zero in the objective. Okay, so 5 and 0. If this was x5 and x1, then it will be 0, 5. Okay, so that order is important. And the identity is coming from here. So those x1 and x5 were your initial basic variables. So you're going to add um, those two columns to get the inverse. And right there is the inverse. 
Thank you for catching that. It should be one. So it will be five times one is five, zero, yeah. Still five, zero. Thank you. Okay. So the next problem is essentially the same type of problem. So I'm gonna let you work on that one and let me know if you have questions. But again, you should express something like this in the exam. So make sure that you understand how to perform that type of analysis. Okay, so we are running out of time. Do you have questions? Yes. Are you proposed to work six On words, that's the current one? Mm -hmm. Yes, I can post it. Yeah, you, you please submit your homework anyway. So work on it and submit it. They have the exam to do that. No, you do it Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now you're doing this. You're talking about homework. Yeah, story. Yeah. So I can. I will post them tomorrow. So just give it a try without looking at the solution. I think that will give you an idea of if you understand what you're doing or not. And then try to look at the solution. And let me know if you have questions. Again, I'm gonna be here tomorrow and on Monday after after 1 p.m. So if you have questions, let me know. Okay. Good. So I'll see you on Tuesday if you don't meet me before that.